Public health is a science of protecting the safety and improving the health of communities through education, policy making and research. Ghana's public health system has grown considerably in the past 60 years, but with a population growth of 2.5% a year and over 30 million people by 2020, many questions have been asked about the state of our public health system and our readiness to deal with public health issues that crop up. With recent developments amidst the lack of proper infrastructure in most parts of the country for prevention, cure and research, the public health system is said to be plodding along with severe challenges in spite of some of the best trained professionals doing their very best to manage the challenges. The problems associated with disease prevention and control recently came to the fore with cases of H1N1 influenza and meningitis found in some schools in the country. Tonight on Talking Point, we take a look at the public health system and explore ways to bring it at par with international standards and best practices. What accounts for the inadequacies? What radical changes should we make to resolve our public health issues? Tonight on Talking Point, I am joined by two very competent people who would unravel the mystery of our public health for us. Before I introduce them, we are live on Ghana Television GTV as well as GBC 24. We are also on DSTV channel 278. If you want to listen to us on radio, you can do so on Unique 95.7 and we are streaming live on GBCGhana.com. My guest in the studio today. I'll start with Dr. Bedou Sarkodie, who is the Director of Public Health at the Ghana Health Service. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Next to him is also Dr. Franklin Nassie Dubekwe, who is the head of disease surveillance at the Ghana Health Service. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Quite interesting that uh, I have both of you here today. Uh, so for our viewers who are interested in public health and are worried about some of the recent happenings around the country, you can join us on our WhatsApp platform, 555 Eight, eight. And this is a discussion that I want all of us to be part of. So let's get interactive and share your opinions and your suggestions and your comments with us on our WhatsApp platforms. Let me start with you, um, Dr. Sarkodia. Yes. Just to give us an overview of what we are going to be discussing today, tell us in your words, since you were there, what is the true state of our public health system? Thank you very much. Um, the public health systems in the country has the responsibility at just kind of this, what is expected, what is the situation, and then the way forward. Right. We have this responsibility to ensure, as you already mentioned, the security of the general population in terms of health security, and then also protecting the health of the general community. Indeed, the Manage the health sector instead of dealing with one patient at a time. The public health deals with a group of people in the community as a clientele. We have the responsibility to assess continuously what is happening within the entire general population and then make policies to drive the best uh, issues that would uh, let the people have the best of health within the country and then provide assurance and these are being done in the country through the Ministry of Health Ghana Health Service and through the public health division of the country. We talk about public health but then it encompasses a lot of components and for each event when talking about public health emergencies in particular, we have to deal with the preventive, the promotive, the creative, and then the when if we, following the emergency, we need to recover from whatever has happened. You see that the players are many and are scattered in a lot of, not just disciplines, but in a lot of sectors. There's a need to have basic infrastructure, there's a need to have, the people should have adequate information, there's a need to have adequate emergency workforce to address all the challenges that would befall on us. 
and talking about the assessment to ensure the health security of the country. We need to build adequate uh, public health workforce. There's a need, the infrastructure aspect, we need to make sure that all that we require should be provided. But we've come this far, but there's still a lot to be done. We put that in context, put that in context, a lot to be done. Where are we, basically? Where should we be, yes. and where are we now? Public health delivery globally. The various centers for disease control, disease control and prevention, CDCs, are the yardsticks for assessment of the standards of public health. That will deal in totality communicable diseases, non communicable diseases, trauma and injury. So we have to look in totality and see how best the systems in country prevent and protect against these conditions as mentioned how these systems prevent and when that something happens, we detect, investigate, early respond, and then recover from it. So a lot of investment is required. We have come to some extent this far, but um, there's still a lot more to be done. We will look at the public health practice in general in quite situation where you step on, you stand in the quiet environment and prefer, prepare adequately for the rest. Mm. Okay. That will mean that in the time of quiet, when you don't have any emergencies, for instance, you put in measures to adequately prepare and put mechanisms in place to respond to all the various emergencies that would happen. So, all these things need to be done, and as a country, there's a lot more to... We are nowhere near... We, there's a lot more we are, to Okay. I, I think that's being very political. We are a lot more, <laughs> rather than just pinning it. Uh, uh, Dr. Asiedu, let, let me ask you. You, you. Are you aware of the growing agitation and frustration of the public with our public health system? Uh, you, as head of the disease uh, surveillance, are you aware that people are uh, extremely worried that we are not prepared for any eventuality if, if it should happen. Um, thank you very much. Um, let me say that I think that Ghana is not optimal in terms of preparedness, but we are not that low in terms of grading. We just uh, had a, an assessment done um, about 11 months ago whereby WHO did what they call the joint external evaluation. And Ghana's health security was assessed in all the various um, 19 technical areas. And clearly there are areas that Ghana is doing very well. There are areas that we need to improve. Let me say that I think that we have a challenge maybe in communicating some of the issues we need to address. If you look at this current, let's say, outbreak that we were in, and you want to analyze it by day by day, and the actions that we took. I mean, it's comparable to what is done in most countries in the world, developed countries. Because clearly it tells you that there's a system in place in terms of human resource, there's a system in place in terms of laboratory to actually detect the supposed wrong and address it. Mm -hmm. Yes, but let me tell you what really happened. If you look at the system that we have set up in the schools, people come to the facility, or let's say the, the clinics, with complaints. So the complaint is somebody comes in with a fever and headache and joint pains. For our certain core Ghana, that commonest presentation is malaria. So if you look at the school setup, they diagnosed malaria. And the, the person was treated with anti malarials and given antipyretic. That's the standard across. The person now goes home because she has been detained, temperature is dropped down, he goes home and comes back the next day, you no, know, after two hours very weak and very fed. So it tells you there's a system in place to give first aid and to refer, which is fair. Then you, look, you get to a second case who also dies similar to the first one. But clearly let me say that you diagnose what is common until you have subsequent cases and then the autopsy is done. 
and the autopsy findings kind of depicts an area of viral hemorrhage fevers. Our system now picks samples, send it to the Gucci to be tested. It gets there and it's negative. So in that case, you are looking at viral hemorrhage fevers, it's negative. You have done malaria, it's negative. You've also suspected meningitis because there was a previous outbreak and it's negative. What do you have to do now? The presentation now changed to now include respiratory symptoms of fever and cough and sore throat. So the system now says, now, could it be influenza? Now we, we start to do throat swab and we get a diagnosis. So there's no lapses here. The system has been followed through based on presenting complaints, based on laboratory findings, and then we have we arrived at the, at the solution. And then we, we put in the necessary measures. Let me say that if you look at the context in which you're operating, H1N1, as at the last literature I looked at in India, May, they had recorded 8,675 cases and 375 have, have died. So it tells you that this is a system, a disease that can kill. We are not saying that people should die. But let me be clear that so far as we are in the world and there are diseases, one or two may slip. But this particular outbreak, I don't see any slip by our system. What we need to do is to improve on our communication. You know, currently now, we are in an era of aggressive media. So we need to make sure that we are in tune with them and then we share the common knowledge. And then we can actually allay the fears of the... the so, 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 so all that you've said, basically, is the agitation is misplaced. People should not be agitated because you have everything under control. Yes, what I'm saying is that if you have... Not everything is no, coming, but... Yeah, what I'm saying is that we... What I see as a gap was a communication that we could not dialogue well with the general population. But in terms of your processes? Yes, the, what we're doing is what we're supposed we're to have been done. Process so so if process. maybe if I'd engage the public well to know that this is the situation we are handling and this, what, this is the process we are going through, maybe the backlash would have been minimal. But clearly, there's no lapses. Our lab systems are working. Our health professionals are trying to do the best that we have to do. Dr. Zako, you wanted to add something to what you were saying? Yes, indeed. Um, the issues on preparedness, this process, and for now, we are not optimal, as you rightly mentioned. Mm -hmm. According to the JEE, there are some gaps in the preparedness process to be addressed. But then, um, with all these uh, challenges, whatever when we are faced with a situation, the response is not delayed. People take adequate steps to uh, use appropriate science to address the situation. And as much as possible, um, irrespective of the comments that are coming indeed, if I should do assessment at the districts, the facility, the districts, then the regions and the national level, um, they have been working with all these um, challenges, but the, the process of getting to investigate and responding, we have been very timely and there were no, there were no lapses. It's quite interesting that you say that because I have spoken to first respondents normally uh, who go to the scene of uh, diseases and medic, and for most of them, they tell you that they are just doing the best that they can because they don't have what it takes to ensure that it's contained. But I'm hearing something completely different from both of you in terms of this particular, uh, because the first respondents in this case, those who were at the sick bay, mm. did not know what was happening. Yes, as, as, as I keep on saying, you see, the, the disease, you get close to it based on presenting complaints. Typically, as I said, you have, you have a school of about 2,800, and they have a sick bay, which is manned by physician assistant and, and road nurses. And they have been seeing cases who are normally malaria. So these are children or students who present typically of malaria. They have fever, headache, and joint pains. And as, as I keep on saying, typically you have at that low level, what do you suspect is malaria? So then they go, up, they go on to treat for malaria. They give the anti malaria based on the national protocol and they give an antibiotic to bring the temperature down. The child 
thermometer goes down and then he's asked to go to the dormitory. He goes to the dormitory and then he come, comes back complaining of weakness and was referred. Let me say that maybe the challenge here is that the school doesn't have an ambulance. So it's a whole school set up that they have to use their bus to, to refer. Not only the school, all across the country, we have first respondents have a challenge. Yeah, I think that we are talking about this, okay. this incident. Let, let so that's why maybe I'm trying, I'm trying to, if you say I, across I, board, let, let, let then, me then it's a different <laughs> issue here. You see, uh, here. the um, diagnosis of every case and then diagnosis of Abbey goes through a process. When somebody comes to the, let, let's start from school, infirmary, with fever, headache, and neck pain, the immediate thinking, as you rightly mentioned, people will think about the commonest, and malaria is the it most the common, that sort yeah. of thing. So if somebody, based on these signs and symptoms, suspect malaria, <laughs> and start investigating in that direction, it's appropriate. Then based on what has happened earlier, and the high index of suspicion because of the neck pain together with the fever and they suspected possible meningitis and took steps to address it to come to final confirmation and samples were taken and were negative it's also appropriate to think meningitis if you are in the season the school has suffered outbreak of meningitis earlier about a few months ago and about seven people have died and there are fever, headache, neck pain, and some of them elicited some signs of neck stiffness, which this syndrome fits adequately with meningitis. So people thinking in that direction and investigating accordingly to us appropriate. And I think the third day or so, when the, the rest of the patients that were coming in at that time were eliciting features of acute respiratory illness, at that time, because we thought malaria treated and still people are coming down now, it's more of a meningitis. You investigated and it's negative, people are coming down and signs of respiratory illness are in. Then you think of influenza like illnesses, it's also appropriate. People are using adequate information available at that time to make the diagnosis. So you have two things in one, you have to make diagnosis of the individual cases. And because the cases were coming in excess of what is expected numbers, we had to also diagnose the outbreak. So all the very putting all in context, the various investigations that were done were all appropriate. Until finally the sample taken and was confirmed to be the influenza. So the first few days, two people dying with fever, headache, neck pain. It will be difficult immediately to say this is influenza, and no clinician can immediately point at influenza at that time. Mm. So it was due process with the emerging of the outbreak and then the symptoms that they were coming, and then following adequately, meaning that there were systems in place that were following and monitoring the progress and chronology. So at any time, based on adequate inf adequacy information available, the necessary investigations are done until finally we ended up with the final conclusion and it came out to, to be influenza. Okay. So the people will say, so I've heard some comments that, so it was even finally, it was Neguchi that will say it was, that's fine, Neguchi did what to do, it's our national influenza center, and they are not even supporting only Ghana. So at any time, that is part of our public health emergency system. So it's not that something ended somewhere and later, the sequence of events required that Based on the signs and symptoms, you examine the patient and the body, and then you do other ancillary support investigations, including x-rays and laboratory tests. And all that has happened, they are all sequence of events which is part of our national public health emergency structures okay. and apparatus. So it was movement from one step to another. Till finally, we ended up with the final diagnosis and we confirmed the individual cases, confirmed the outbreak, and then the necessary response mechanisms were immediately activated. So looking at this context, elsewhere, we would have even taken this sample to a referral laboratory outside the country, which some, it takes some time to ship the sample, probably to Institute Pasteur, if it's Dakar or somewhere, or to CDC Atlanta. 
to take time to go in there, they will work on it. The expediency and the agency that Noguchi gave this may not be given by other people, though they are working uh, very, also have in mind the need for agency. This sample went to Noguchi within 12 hours. They are finished with the um, assessment. One is saying that we suspect it was likely. Within 12 hours, it came in the evening, the next morning in the night, they worked in the next morning, they gave us. Okay. Results. So there are, these are available. We have some challenges to some extent. However, when it comes to the need to do what needs to be done based on the resource and facilities available, people do best. Okay. I mean, the other thing, and uh, uh, Dr. Dr. Sidibek, you can, you can answer this. The other thing that uh, uh, comes to light in, in, in the midst of all of this is that we are a growing population. Yes. And, and the population of Ghana, unknown to many people, is increasing by 2.5% every year according to the, the National Statistical Service to, um, uh, population census, which simply means that within the next three years, this country will be over 30 million people. Yet, we don't have corresponding infrastructure and facilities mm -hmm. to match the growing people. It, it, it means that if there's a major epidemic in this country, we will be in serious trouble. Do you have in place measures to curb a huge, for example, if the H1N1, which was, uh, the students had been all asked to go home, it could have been a different story. Mm -hmm. Do we have what it takes to handle a major? Okay, thank you very much. Um, I think that, um, uh, as I, I, I said, um, to meet the priorities of the international health regulations, the, every country has what they call core capacities that you need to um, attain. So Ghana has its challenges in certain areas. If you look at the what, what are the areas? Where are the where are our challenges? Yeah, what I'm saying is that there are about 19 of them. So each area we have some pluses and minuses. But then when you talk about when we had Ebola, we, at that time we realized that we did not have like a, a national infectious disease center that can handle cases. So at that time the idea was to build one in each of the three zones in the country. Mm -hmm. So we, we built, put up one in Tema that was supposed to serve the southern zone. And, and then to have, we're supposed to have one in the middle zone and one in the northern zone. As I speak now, it's only the southern zone that is completed. So, so, and then the northern zone also has a center. So the middle zone has no such a facility. So we, as a country, does not... The north has an infectious disease center? We have a facility. But then the, the south also has the treatment center that can handle highly infectious disease conditions because we learned it from the Ebola. Right. But the, the middle does not have it because we could not complete our schedule to have all the, 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 the areas for such areas. And surprise, surprise, Ashanti region, which is in the middle, is the most populous region. Yes. So I think that um, one other area is that we have achieved some success in some area, like for cholera. You know, cholera is very common in the southern belt, particularly in Greater Accra. So the plan for the country was to have cholera treatment centers. It was the plan was to have five. Now we have four. So if we have, let's say, a, a, a boom of cholera, we have some facilities that can handle those cases. But as I said, if it's a very highly infectious disease condition, then we are, we are deficit in the middle belt. For human resource, thankfully, we have well-trained scientists and epidemiologists and clinicians and doctors if you look at the, the let's say for a target is to have like one epidemiologist in 20,000 persons in the country Ghana has been able to achieve that that target so one for how many people 20,000 per population epidemiologists is that a WHO standard yes that's a standard okay so we, we um, because we have um, these training schools in Ghana, the Ghana Field Epidemiology Training Program and the Ghana College of Physicians and Surgeons Training Epidemiologists. So in that context, you realize that the human capacity is somehow good. What we have, which I think we are improving, let me say that for when it comes to Ghana, addressing our challenges, we do it together with our partners. And CDC and WHO are crucial in our perspective. We had a challenge with our laboratory system. Particularly two years ago when we had a meningitis outbreak, we had a challenge about diagnosis and transporting of the samples. And CDC has helped us to establish our um, center in Tamale. So that's a national treatment center for meningitis. And we are in meningitis season. So it is a top of the art lab. 
that can diagnose mal uh, meningitis. Because for meningitis, you need to be able to pinpoint the pathogen for the intervention. So if you look at it across board, infrastructure-wise, maybe for access factor, physical, we have some deficit. For the laboratory, because as Dr. Sakodia said, we have the Wuchi, which is a world-class lab. They have maybe challenges, maybe subsistence of some of the regions, but the human capacity is intact. So we have an advantage in that perspective. Human resource, we have the doctors, the nurses, and epidemiology. So if you look at it in total, Ghana is not optimal, but we can handle an outbreak if it's okay. The e focus is for health security. It's about early detection. That's the focus, so that you can keep very early. It doesn't get to a large proportion. When we were having this outbreak, I remember our DG was saying, could it be a new virus? Because that's how you get things like Ebola. Because we have done the basic investigations. We are looking for malaria. We are looking for meningitis. We are looking for VHF. They were all negative. What was it? And luckily, we had an organism which is not new. So I think that we have a system in place. It's not optimal yet, but it's ready to address public health emergencies. So, so Dr. So Sakodi, again, mm -hmm. I, 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 I like to hammer on this because people outside, and, and normally before these programs, we try and do our research, and most people are worried that we can't handle major uh, uh, epidemics if they hit this country. But it's assuring to, to, for, to hear you say that uh, we can. Now, right. Um, I agree with him. The systems, you see, at any time, you assess the situation, look at what the available resource and infrastructure can do, when you need to reach out for others to come in. What happened in Liberia, Sierra Leone, and those countries that were affected with Ebola? At a point in time, they, even, they, they did what they could do. Things were getting out of hands. Then you start best with what you can do. And when you need to call in for others to come in, you need immediately to activate the system to get others to come in to support. When you need to apply the vaccines, you don't manufacture those vaccines here. So we may need to reach out with partners support to identify the source of the vaccine and use. When you are faced and challenged with the number of people to respond to the outbreak, you let it know this is what we have on hand. Our structures require that for now, based on the situation on hand, there's a need for others that could be international partners to come into support. What is most important, he rightly mentioned that the current system within the country should do best and do preventive activities. You do best to make sure that you early detect. Nobody can say that outbreaks will not happen. But then when the outbreaks do happen, you are, if you fail to pick it early, then the system is severely challenged. When you detect the, the surveillance system is such that it can quickly detect the outbreak, and then once you've detected, you know the various mechanisms to respond to it. So you assess your preparedness situation at that time and looking at the magnitude. If the local domestic resource is not in position to respond to the outbreak, quickly you know what is required and then you call for backup for others to come in to help. Do not sit down and say that you can do it and that look at Ghanaians coming more coming down more with the outbreak and then a lot more dying. No, nobody will do that and as much as sense of responsibility. Consistently to look at what you could do, what is required next, and then when there's a need for others to come in, then you call for adequately. You mentioned the joint external evaluation that was consulted. That looks at those 19 areas, look at the prevention, early detection, notification, response, and recovery. Emergency operation systems, the legal issues as to what is the legal backing for the public health emergency response within the country. What is the legal backing that mandates government to put in this quantum sum of money to make sure that as we uh, prepare the national budget, when we just went, came from some time not long ago, Korea, they spent their EOC, the CDC Korea, they're giving up to the quantum sum of 250 million US dollars 
to respond to public health emergencies. They have decided to invest adequately into that, and that enhances the public health security of the country. As much as the people well-trained, prepared to do the work, are in there and we lack infrastructure, there's always be challenge in the response. So things that we require, there's a need for the country to invest in public health emergency um, response, to enhance our preparedness and response plans, and that is what that's what the rationale behind subjecting our systems for the joint external evaluation. We know our strength, we know the structures available, we know the gaps that have been identified, and I think we should have done it this year, this month. But then due to the numerous activities, we spoke to the partners to hold on so that early January next year, all those gaps identified in these areas there's a need to plan adequately to provide the necessary resource and funding to make sure that we build minimal set of standards and capacity to respond to public health emergencies. And when we mention this, I believe that the various um, funding mechanisms in the country from the ministry, from the presidency, and all our look and finance ministry you listen very well to this. We are looking at all hazards that includes the biologic, the nuclear, and the mechanical, using whole of government apparatus. That will mean that if there's a need to prevent cholera, and you need water, um, safe water, and the agency that has the responsibility to provide safe water will be adequately resourced to improve and make sure that... But I, I would have thought that, for example, for 2018, the budget has already been been read. And you made our input. So your input. and you made input there and defended it. But the truth of the matter is that the public health director did not even get the money you requested for 2017. You got part of it, but you didn't get, you didn't get as much as you wanted. So it tells me that... Our investment into the response is not adequate. It's not adequate. So we still have a huge problem because you're not even getting the funding that you require to... to a need for secured ring fence funding for public health agencies. Because if you don't do that, it's at the time of the crisis that you're looking around to look for support. It's very unfortunate. We have a clear, we have a clear example now of vaccines, uh, Dr. Dr. Bekwe, vaccines. Um, the vaccines that you required to give to the students. That, that is not due to the, uh, the funding, indeed. That, that's, you you did not have not, the vaccines. The va but then you don't uh, stockpile those vaccines in country. So to be honest, that one is not, whatever it is, no matter how much funding you have provided, at the point in time with the vaccines, but the case, may reach out mm -hmm. for the vaccine. But one of the things that I have been told is that many of the drugs, that the vaccines that we need in this country are not available. That, that no, no. They, they are not in country. I don't know. Let me make the point. Are you saying? Are you saying we don't? We don't? We don't stock vaccines. We stock vaccines. For now, um, the list of vaccines that you what are the are vaccines? 13, thirteen of them. Right. And those thirteen vaccines for our regular expanded program organization, we have adequate stockpile for now. Those vaccines for H1N1 is not part of our routine vaccination. And then when you have an outbreak, then you request for it for support. Indeed, some countries use it as those in the temperate areas where flu is a major problem over there. They stockpile and then period, and every year everybody goes for a shot, about twice within the year as part of their routine the, um, EPI. But can, the flu vaccine is not part of our routine EPI. So when you have an outbreak, then you require So it. what you are saying is that we have 13 different vaccines on on the list yes and we do have all 13 in stock is that what you're saying that, that, that's correct okay that's correct then <laughs> I, I, i'll move on if, if you are showing us that you have it so because that's, that's, that's that correct. is not the 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 case mm -hmm. that uh, uh but, but if i may come in see i think that they, they are a group of vaccines you see they're talking about the routine ones which is used mm -hmm. for the immunization particularly in the child, children child, yes. child yes. but then when it comes to like outbreaks mm -hmm. You see, like I, I, I hear some people talking about why don't we vaccinate all the all the students? Right. You see, in the time past, 
whereby the, the pathogen was very unique. It was very a particular type. The country had a, a, a system whereby, on an annual basis, the target group was vaccinated. Now the pathogen has now moved on. So we do, it's no more the, the common type that you can actually stockpile. The type that we have now, which is the W, is limited in supply. So you need to have a criteria to be met before you can get access to that particular um, set of vaccines. So it is not that like the vaccines are sitting there, they go and buy them and put them down. No. Earlier on, when it was group A, then every country can go and buy it and stockpile and then do preventive management. But now, for the W, they do more of a reactive because it's very limited in quantity. When you have an outbreak and you meet the criteria, you made a request to ICG and then they give it to you. So like last year, we had an, a vaccination exercise in Upper West where Nadoli and the rest were, 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 were affected. So I think that normally I think that we need to engage the public the more to explain what is it that we are doing, what are the gaps. And when that is done, then the confidence is built around what we are doing. And clearly, for this same outbreak, I'm sure maybe if you can explain properly to the average. And I think that I keep on saying that the media should see themselves as part of players in health security. It's not about pointing fingers, but other you create panic and fear. When we see ourselves as partners in health security, the tension goes down. And the, and the professionals but, I mean, but I mean, that should not be blamed on the media no. because, it's, it's because it, 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 no, I, I, said, I said we have our talent. Absolutely. Yeah, no the public well. health who has engaged the media and let us know what you're doing. Yes. But if you don't, the media would always go and look for stories that make the news anyway. So when a story like that hits uh, a campus in Damango or whatever, somebody's going to pick it up. But you have to explain that these are the challenges we face. These are the things we have put in place, and this is how we are going to roll out. Uh, for example, a, in 2018, this is how the public health system wants to wants to work. Mm. But none of those comes to the fore. So, no, I think that <laughs> we we that's what we have realized. That's our challenge. That we are actually not engaging the key players as much as possible to explain our actions, and that's what we clearly want to do. Now we are in the majority season. We plan to actually engage the media. That when you have, but I mean, is not recorded on a daily basis, mm. but it's actually recorded over a period of weeks so that we don't see we have one case there and one case there, it causes confusion because it's an endemic condition. So I think that we have realized our gaps. We want to engage the media the more so that they will all see ourselves as players to ensure sanctity in our health security. I think that what I want to say is that for Ghana, when it comes to our response, we do it together with our partners, CDC and WHO. When we went to the fraud, it was a joint team. CDC was on standby. What actually do we need, which is not in country, they will bring it in. Right. So we do not just wait for things to go so bad and they come in. It's a joint effort with the key partners. And I keep on saying that when we engage the public the more, you will understand what we are doing and then they will be reassured. One of the things that the Ghana Health Service has been accused of is not speaking against the terrible sanitation conditions of this country, which is a, which in effect, then becomes a huge health risk. And it's been left to the, the Ministry of Sanitation, but the Ghana Health, health Service itself has not been involved at all. I don't think it's correct. In, in, well, I, I don't think it's correct. I remember clearly that I have been in a meeting with the mayor of Accra and about three times at a time that we were having that severe terrible corona outbreak within the country. And we discussed issues, what was happening in that Lavender Hill. And based on those discussions, immediately he's saying that they will do best to eliminate Lavender Hill. We were monitoring. And we realized that they were taking steps to... But the point is, so nobody is hearing your voices. No, but then we you, take you, steps you understand what I'm saying? Because we go to where we need... We have to do advocacy to make certain things happen. For instance, we're talking about sanitation. So if you see who should directly address the issue, then you move into you, you mention the health implications of what is happening, and then the need to make the uh, improve on the sanitary conditions, and then you move on. You think so the Ministry of Education or the Ghana Health uh, Service cannot in itself 
begin to educate people on how to keep the environment clean and to make sure that sanitation is, is cared? You think that it has to go the, through uh, somebody else the, the, before the, that is, is done? The, 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 when you are talking about sanitation and hygiene, that's what individuals should do, what group of people Absolutely. should do, what the leadership should do. The general education at the national level here, you may not see things happening, but then go to the regions and districts. There are a lot of public education going mm. on, and those are part, they are all part of the health systems. So when we don't come to studio, sit and talk like that, don't think that nothing is happening. Mm. They organize public debates, they organize all form of activities that bring to people together, even at the OPDs. They discuss these things at the OPDs. And some of these uh, uh, um, 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 challenges that you may have going to the studios, the big studios, to reach out to the mass media. Indeed, issues on attitudinal change, where people have to change lifestyle. The mass education is good, but then the one-on-one -on -one encounter could go on in the community is what indeed helps. What we need to do here at the national level is to come out with the various policy guides to make sure that things move down and check it down to the community level from the regions, district, and then the community. And then the other agencies who also need to come in to support. We let them know what they should do to support because the, the, the total sum for health delivery is maybe, maybe scattered in a lot of agencies. You mentioned the sanitation. And when we are talking about sanitation in a metropolis, it's the mayor who falls under local government, and that's the person that we need to target. So we have to play a lot of advocacy role, though it's not optimal, but then we're doing it and as much as possible when there's a need for water improvement to ensure um, access, safe access to safe water. The, gas, the health sector cannot do it, but then you need to reach out and play advocacy with that. As this is happening, if you don't provide enough water and safe water to the people, then you have looming outbreak of waterborne and water-related diseases. So those advocacy activities is very important, and when you do it, it may not come to you, you may not know. But then those various agencies that we need to meet and reach out to and well, let we them are, know their role. We are waiting for the day the Ghana Health Service will take the Accra Metropolitan Orita to task or to court, if it so be, to clear the rubbish that is on the street. That will, at the end of the day, come back to you to go and treat yeah. these people. If you can do we, something like that, we people will sit up. We wish to agree and, uh, with them to do best than waiting till it ends in the court. Take them to court. That, that if time, they're not doing what you want, because the health of the people matters. Well, well there you go. One, it may be one of the options. But then, <laughs> for us, you think that there are a lot more other options so that they will constantly lay, be in a dialogue terms and listen to advocacy. But when you meet in the court, and that is where you're going to, that will be the play field. But the play field is where we need to agree and talk as brothers and make sure that we all work and plan together and that we have one plan for health security. Part of it is lodged with you. Please, let's make sure that you work and do your best and make sure you provide your part optimally for entire health security of the country. All right, let's listen to what uh, the public is saying. Uh, we, have to, we have to engage them. Okay, this one says, uh, seriously, communications issue. Does the health ministry not have a communication department? It's about time the doctors shifted focus from diagnosing malaria all the time. I haven't had malaria in 20 years. Our doctors need to be open-minded. I am seriously alarmed when a doctor prescribed malaria needs for my dying father who was complaining of stomach issues. May he rest in peace. Seriously. Okay. Ghana's public health is truly on life supports. Let's act proactively. And that's... Um, uh, from Rebecca in Tema. The health institutions from the dexterous to the regional hospitals do not have the basic diagnostics equipment like chemistry analyzers and others. This makes the work of the clinicians very difficult. The laboratories of the hospitals are ill-equipped. Our public health system is not functional as it's supposed to be. 
currently they have limited themselves into consulting rooms and managing HIV and hepatitis, etc. They've left the community unattended to. Example, Agogulushi Market, where people are selling in filth, and that's from me. Um, our, our professionals emphatic that what we need on our hands is H1N1, has, auto, uh, has autopsy confirmed this. Please let's intensify national campaign on cleanliness. Too much rubbish everywhere. City centers, road shoulders, etc. Let's not wait for another epidemic when solutions are yet to be found to what is happening in our senior high schools. God help us. Help us. I suggest public health should also look at mobile health care to some institutions, both governmental and private, for quick health care. And this one says, this is Yvonne. Your panelists are speaking very eloquently that I am tempted to believe all is well and we have a robust public health system. However, from the Ebola scare from three years ago, I don't believe we have such a system. The current situation in Kumasi High School was a clear indication. Enough with the talk shops already. How is it that after three years, the middle sector's infection center is still not ready? Is this age, in this age, we still have cholera outbreaks. It's not acceptable. Kindly tell your panelists that the media is not responsible for alerts during health outbreaks. The public health must have a protocol on reporting disease outbreak for the media to follow. Obviously, if there exists no such protocol, they will run with whatever story they can lay their hands on. Why is the Ministry of Health delaying the provision of legis uh, legis legislative instruments for the laboratories in Ghana to properly function and provide early detection of diseases? So these are some of the text messages coming uh, uh, to us from uh, from our viewers. Um, Dr. Seydou quite interesting that people don't really believe uh, most of what you said about the state of the public health uh, system, because these are the very people who are affected by the public health system, especially in the hinterlands. We may be in the cities and see the beautiful hospitals that have been built, yet our brothers and sisters who are miles away, in fact, just go outside Accra, towards Amasaman and the rest, and the state of uh, some of these hospitals and, 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 and places where people have to go, first respondents and, and the rest, are sometimes non-existent. Uh, uh, OK, let me start. Um, I will use measles as an example. Right. When I was in the medical school, every morning during ward rounds, children died of measles were being thrown into caskets, like anything. Mm -hmm. Measles, EPI, and vaccination is part of the public health systems. And measles is one of the diseases targeted for, at that time, for control. And now we are moving to elimination. Mm -hmm. And for now, even in the medical school now, the lecturers are stri struggling to get typical music case for teaching. This is telling you how far you've come and public health has addressed this. So the 13 diseases that we measles, TB, and other disease conditions that we have mounted intensive as part of the program on immunization against, most, some of them are near elimination and using measles as an example. Mm -hmm. So you can use that and saying that um, despite all the challenges, we have come this far. The one thing with um, public health, when we have emergency on hand, people need one person dying just too many, as I'll put it. So it's distressful and disheartening see people dying. Everybody wish the magic something should be done and immediately um, what has happened one it should what what you see now within short time immediately nothing should happen again. Saying that outbreaks will not happen those that we have the mechanisms to prevent and protect against, where we have the effective vaccination and the vaccines are readily available, we always recommend to the authorities to invest into those areas to ensure the security of the people. 
some of them, the vaccines are not produced in enough quantities for people, for countries, to go and procure and deliver. Okay, we, we understand all of that. So, well, what about what about people in the hinterlands? Right. Who don't have, some of them have to be put on, on trucks, some on bicycles, some on uh, what they call the, the tricycle, to get them to a hospital that is sometimes 30, 40 miles away. What is the public health uh, or the Ghana Health Service doing about such people? We talk about chip compounds. Some of them are closed. They are not open, waiting for some commissioning or something like that. It is dire if we admit those in the, the urban centers may be okay, but the majority of Ghanaians who live in these areas, in some places, doctors don't even want to go. It's Ma a problem. Mentioning chips is even, to me, it's more reassuring that the government, the ministry, the Ghana service is always looking for new ways to bring service to the doorstep of the people that need me, that will need it. And that whilst formally looking at the situation where people have to travel all this far to come and assess health delivery. Now you say you bring health delivery to your doorstep and that is the concept of CHIPS. And as much as possible, yearly, the functional CHIP systems where CHIP compounds, where people live very close within the community and make sure that they do outreach activities, moving homes to do um, home, um, 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 care for the people within the homes. And then monitoring, they give the opportunity for them to monitor the environmental conditions within the homes. That is the background of CHIPS. Right. Indeed, as much as possible, um, at any time, new ideas come, new concepts come, and the CHIP that you mentioned yourself, the idea is to bring health delivery to the doorstep of the people. We, we totally agree with that, but they are not. They are not getting. Oh, they, they are not getting they, the care they, they that they out, want they uh, from from these chip compounds because some of them have uh, don't have any doctors. Doctors don't, don't even go there. No, let, the chips don't. The doctors let, don't let, work in chips. Let, let me let me bring no, uh, let uh, doctor. Doctor. Yeah, okay, that's fine. Chips. Let me bring uh, uh, Doctor Requin in, uh, in, in, in in the same discussion where we are having mm -hmm. in terms of how do people in the hinterlands get the public health care that they require. Uh, those of us in Accra can easily walk into any hospital. They can't. Mm. That's the truth. Yes, um, um, thank you very much. I think that um, there, there, there were two obvious challenges affecting healthcare in Ghana. Was the financial assets and geographic assets. So the insurance was supposed to address the financial assets bit. And then the, this concept of chips was to, was to address the geographic assets. So it is not wholly right that the people further down are off the system. Um, if you look at the health center that we run, at the very lower level, the chips compound, we have what the community of nurses who are in charge. And they provide minimal clinical services and more of preventive services. The idea is that they need to be able to detect conditions as early as possible and offer the necessary care that it does. And the plan now is that every electoral area must have a chip compound. And that is how we are trying to improve on access. So it is a work in progress. But let me say something that Ghana's emergency preparedness is, is under a framework, a framework which is structured at a national, regional, and district. And it's, it's premised on certain thematic areas of surveillance, case management, risk, com risk communication, and laboratory system. We are not here to speak English. As far as we are concerned, the idea is that Ghana has a system. It is not optimal, but it is working. What we do is that when there's a challenge, we need to make sure we identify all the key players to address uh, the, the problem. Now, like tomorrow, we have what they call the National Technical Coordinating Committee meeting. This is a, a platform which all the key technical persons, they go beyond the Ghana House. When you talk about public health issues, it's about academia, it's about several institutions. They sit down and analyze what is the problem, who is supposed to address what issue. And this structure exists at the national level. When you go to the regions and the district, you have what they call the Public Health Emergency Management Committee whereby when an issue occurs in the region, it's the regional minister who is in charge because it's about health security. So he brings to bear all the technical expertise in that perspective to address the issues. So there's a structure in place. And I think that we need to engage more 
of the, of okay. the media or in the Nigerian population. Let me say that we have issues about funding. And that's why we are coming clear with our national public health action plan for health security. That the whole country, together with the partners, are now going to invest to improve our health security. All right. My, 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 my director tells me that uh, our time is fast spent. I'll, I'll read the last two um, text messages from our, from our viewers. Our health system is indeed on life support. We are just not serious as a country in responding to public health emergencies. What happened to the systems that were put in place during the recent past Ebola outbreak in our other neighboring countries? The budget that has already been approved has not has not has no component to respond to public health emergencies. Kudos for this explanation on the readiness of the public of the struggling public health system. As a responsible nation, we need to invest in the health of our people. How is Ghana linked up to the idea of establishing Africa's CDC? Where are we with it? Gentlemen, that's all time would, uh, would, would give us uh, uh, for, um, uh, unfortunately. But uh, I think it's, it's a good start. Um, and we look forward to you engaging us uh, uh, some, some more in terms of Ghana's public health. So we definitely will come to you. I've been speaking to Dr. Bedou Sakwadeh, who is the Director of Public Health, Ghana Health Service, and Dr. Franklin Asidu Bekwin, who is the Head of Disease Surveillance of Ghana Health Service. I, I, I believe strongly that the public health is not just for the Ghana Health Service or the Ministry of Health. It's for every single one of us. You take care of yourself. You do the right things. You do the things that you have to do. Keep your environment clean. Keep your surroundings clean. Make sure that you are okay wherever you are, what you eat, what, and all of those things. So it makes the work of the public health professionals easier, a little bit easier. On that note, we'll see you again. My name is Jyoti Ajman, and this is Talking Point.